Good evening and good evening and good evening once again. Thank you for joining us here on another live episode of Real Talk with Heath Brady, the show where we ask the tough questions, those questions that a lot of Christians are afraid to ask or answer. The place where we look at what's going on in our culture and we ask, what does scripture have to say about that? Tonight is part two in our latest series called Hashtag Blessed, where we're picking apart the question of what does it mean to really be blessed. Uh, you can see it all over your, our social media, all over our news, all over everything. You've got people talking about how they're blessed. And, um, you know, we really should deep dive into that subject, especially now, because I think we all could use some blessing with everything that's going on in the world right now. And uh, last week, we we broke into the series. We broke in pretty fast and pretty hard, and we talked about um, this whole subject of, of being blessed. We're in Matthew chapter 5. We're discussing what's known as the Beatitudes, the blessed are the so-and-so, for they shall receive such-and-such such portion of Scripture. And, and uh, I gave you all some historical background, some factual background, some cultural background about what's going on here, the conversation that, that Jesus is having with this large group of tens of thousands of Jewish people who have been following him around since he began his public ministry. And so... Just to kind of uh, refresh our memories a little and, and get us on this, get us all on the same page, um, for for the sake of getting us all caught up again. Um, yeah, here's here's the scene: the 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 Old Testament era ends, and there's roughly a four hundred to four hundred and fifty ish year gap in time between the close of the Old Testament and the time that Jesus uh, shows up on the scene and begins his adult ministry. And so the nation of Israel, when the Old Testament closed, was left wanting and waiting anxiously for their Messiah, for their king uh, to come. That, that one that was promised by the Father, by Almighty God, to rule over the nation of Israel and to be their king and to cause Israel to be an attractional uh, welcoming nation to the entire world. And so they've been waiting and waiting and waiting in anticipation and I would, and I made the argument that after over 400 years, there's probably a lot of folks that lost hope and lost faith, because we are all, in fact, human at the end of the day, and we can lose hope, and lose faith, and lose our stamina in in waiting for the things that are promised to us. And so Jesus shows up, and he starts working these miracles. He's healing people. He's raising people, or he, he's healing lame people. He's healing blind people. Uh, his first public ministry miracle was changing water into wine at a wedding in Cana. And so he's garnished this, this following of tens of thousands of people that are following him around. And we come to Matthew chapter 5, and it's very interesting. They're at the Mount of Olives, and it says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he sat down. And his disciples were all sitting around him. They came to him and he opens up his mouth and he begins to teach to, and he begins to talk to all of them. So remember now, here is, here is the scene. Jesus is the Messiah, of course we know. But these people have been waiting for what seems forever for the Messiah to arrive. And this is a group of people who Rome was in charge and they lived under the thumb of Rome. Rome called all the shots. The, the, Isra the Israelite people, for all intents and purposes, were poor. They were broke. They were lonely. Um, they were enslaved in a lot of circumstances. It was just a very, very tough and difficult time. And on top of all of that, they had the uh, religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who had come up with burdensome religious practices for all of them to follow in order to obtain favor with God. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more tonight. But for the sake of argument, it's very safe to say that this group of people that Jesus is about to speak to, 
are representative of an entire nation that is oppressed and feeling hopeless. And they are looking at this man and thinking, is this the one that we've been waiting for? Is this the Messiah that we've been waiting for? And I can just imagine the hush that falls all over the crowd as Jesus opens his mouth and begins to talk. And they're all shivering with anticipation because they're waiting with bated breath. All of their hope is hinged on what is about to come out of his mouth. And the very first thing that he says is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about this last week, that that this, uh, practically and logically speaking, this was a group of people that were poor. And they were, and their spirits were broken because of all of the different ways that they were poor. We talked about how that Greek word there for poor literally means to be as a homeless beggar on the street. It gives the imagery of someone cowering in the corner with their face covered because they're ashamed of, of their poverty, but they've lost all hope. They've exhausted all of their resources. They've exhausted all of their gifts and abilities and talents. And they've got a handout begging for someone to show them mercy, for someone to put even one coin in their hand so that they can have a loaf of bread for a meal. That literally is the imagery that is presented there with that word poor, and then it tags it with in spirit. So essentially, the person who is spiritually bankrupt is the person who receives the kingdom of heaven. And that the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom that Jesus brought. It is his kingdom. So essentially what Jesus is saying is that, is that those of you who are at the end of your rope, who are at the bottom of the barrel spiritually, who have nowhere else to turn, have nowhere else to look, but to him, to Jesus, you will be in his kingdom. And it says that's how you're blessed. Blessed are those. Blessed are you if you are spiritually bankrupt. And then we talked about that word blessed and how interesting of a word it is. Because Jesus, his ministry and who he was as a human being was so countercultural. Everything that came out of his mouth, everything that he did was totally and completely countercultural. He uses this word blessed, and it's an interesting word in the Greek. It literally means lucky or fortunate or happy. So in other words, what he is saying is that those of us, those of you, those of us who are completely and totally spiritually bankrupt in the face of a holy God and are reaching out for his mercy, we are lucky. Those are the ones who are blessed, who are fortunate, who are lucky because they receive the kingdom. And so that's what we talked about last week. And so this week we move on to the second beatitude. So he's just finished saying, the blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's another huge countercultural statement because he's saying that the ones who are lucky are the one, are the ones who are full of mourning and so you may or may not remember but last week i also said about these beatitudes that each one of them is a progression so a person who mourns is a person who has first become poor in spirit. And that's going to make a little more sense by the end of tonight's episode. Certainly, especially if we want to please God and we want to live our lives for Jesus, we look at this entire list of the blessed are the so-and-sos, and, we would, and, and I would think that we would all want to say, I want to be that person. Because... We tend to look at it through the lens of what we get versus how we get it. We want to look at it through the lens of, I want the blessing. I want to feel happy. I want to feel fortunate. I want to feel lucky. But we're not comfortable with 
what it takes to actually be considered blessed, happy, fortunate, lucky. And so he starts this whole entire list off with the first step in being hashtag blessed in the kingdom of God. He says you got to be spiritually bankrupt. If you are the one who is spiritually bankrupt and you are reaching out begging me for mercy, you are blessed, you are fortunate, you are lucky, and you get to be in the kingdom. And because you are poor in spirit, because you are spiritually bankrupt before me, you are also fortunate and lucky, therefore, when you mourn. So let's talk about that for a second. If I am an individual who has exhausted all of my own efforts and all of my own all of my own resources and I have reached the bottom of my barrel and I have nowhere to look but up and I reach out and beg the Lord for his mercy and he showers me with his mercy the very next thing that is going to take place is that God is going to show me the true condition of my heart. He is going to, for lack of a better term, he is going to more or less expose to me and unveil to me what it is that has caused me to end up spiritually bankrupt. And that's a it's a tough it's a tough concept to really unpack just sitting here in this passage of scripture i'm having problems with my computer guys so i apologize um okay now we're good um when i reach the bottom of the barrel before the lord and he showers me with mercy the very next natural step in the progression of my relationship with the Lord is for him to show me what it was that brought me to that point, that brought me to the lowest of my lows. You know, it's interesting in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, it, Isaiah writes and he, it says that he begged the Lord to show him, he wanted to see the Lord's face so bad. And instead the Lord showed him his own heart. He showed him the condition of his own heart and how just sinful and gross his even his thoughts and his intentions were and so as we unpack the second beatitude and we say the lucky ones the fortunate ones are those who are mournful what are they mourning over and i'm going to suggest something that is so countercultural we mourn over the sin in our life we mourn over the sin in our life we see the very thing that has driven a wedge between ourselves and Almighty God. And we are utterly disgusted to the point of sorrow and mourning over that. It's almost as if, and I'm sure we've all experienced situations like this, somebody's mad at you and they give you the cold shoulder. You don't hear from them for a while. They don't respond to your text message or whatever it is. They blow you off. And it's not like them. And you don't know what's the matter. And it's uncomfortable. You even hang out with them. And they act kind of sus. They act kind of shady around you. And it gets to the point where you're like, okay, I have no idea what is going on. So you go to that person and you say, hey, are we good? Like, what's going on? And especially if that person is worth their salt, they're going to tell you, you did this, and I didn't like it, and I'm upset about it. And now you have no idea that you have upset your friend or upset this person, and maybe you don't even have any idea that you actually did the thing that upset them. So it's this huge, like, revelatory conversation and experience. And from the inside out, because you love that person so much, because you cherish your relationship with that person so much, you are all things apologetic. And it's so disturbing to you 
on the inside especially, that you did something that caused a problem between yourself and that person. And sometimes that thing that we've done that has upset the other person has residual effects that take time to heal over. And, but, but ultimately, at some point, the relationship gets restored. The, the relationship gets fixed and, and you're reconciled to each other. And so that is kind of an image of what we're talking about here, that, that I have come to the bottom of my barrel. I have exhausted all of my resources and the only way for me to look is up. And God pours his mercy out on me. And then he says, now I want you to see the condition of your heart and how you ended up in this place. Because this that I'm going to show you is the thing that has come between you and me. And then he shows us and he exposes the sin in our lives. And that's what drives us to be sorrowful and mournful because we have offended God. So much so that it has kept us separate from him. And now because we have received the kingdom, now because we are saved, we don't want to do anything that's offensive to God. There's a story in the Bible. It's one of my favorite stories. And I've preached on it so many times because I love this story so much. It takes place in John chapter 4. It's the infamous woman at the well story. And there's so much richness in this story. There are so many things to take away from this. But for the sake of our conversation tonight, I, well, I, want, I want us to take away one specific thing. So here's the situation. Jesus is at a well. or Jesus comes to a well in Samaria, and there's a woman there. And they, they strike up a conversation. And he knows things about her. Uh... And it isn't because he's trolling her. (laughs) It isn't because he's spying on her. It isn't because he's weird or anything like that. It's because he is, after all, God. And uh, at one point, he literally exposes the sin in her life to her. He tells her things about her personal life that nobody else in the world would ever know, except the handful of people that are involved. And he's a stranger. He's not from around those parts. And he's literally showing her what her sin is. And she's owning it. And in John chapter 4 verse 19. She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. (laughs) So in other words, he exposes the sin in her life. And tells her and affirms things about her personal life that nobody else would know. Obviously, that's a supernatural gift. But what's interesting is that after they have this conversation, this woman's spirit has transformed from being broken and lowly to excited and thrilled because of the experience that she has just had in this exchange with Jesus. And she runs back home and tells everybody that she met the Messiah. She knows that she met the Messiah. And so the the point that I want you to take away from that story tonight is that this is an individual who had an encounter with the Messiah, who offered her the kingdom because she was at her lowest of lows, and then showed her and exposed to her the sin in her own life, and she had to fix that. And that is the start of this progression. That is the start of what is commonly referred to as the sanctification process. It's the process by which we become more and more like Jesus every single day. And it's a process that he works out in our lives. It's nothing we can do in and of ourselves. So let's refresh. So Jesus turns to this crowd and he tells them that if you are spiritually bankrupt... You are fortunate because you get to be in the the kingdom is offered to you. And now that you're in the kingdom, here's the sin in your life. So during this particular time, you have 
religious leaders, as I said before, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who have set up this religious system of worship in the temple that is all works-oriented. They, they, they've realized that, that before Yahweh, before Almighty God, they are not capable of fulfilling the law. And if you want to know what the law looks like, go back to the Old Testament Read in Exodus and Deuteronomy about the Ten Commandments. Read the entire book of Leviticus just to find out what the priests had to do. And, and there's, there's just more and more on top of all of that. And the whole point of that law was to show that God's chosen people are incapable of being blameless and innocent before God. And they need him to make them blameless and innocent. So here we are. In the New Testament period, and Jesus shows up on the scene, and there is this religious system that has been put in place by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they have created extra stuff to kind of say, well, you know, if if we if we do these things religiously, if we do these things perfectly, then God will be okay with us. And these were things from like how often you washed your hands, which way the water would drip off your fingers while you were toweling off your hands, uh, making sure that you were home by sundown on on the day on um, to celebrate the Sabbath, and I mean all of these different extra rules and regulations that they came up with, and and if you want to know what some of those look like, watch Fiddler on the Roof, because a lot of the things that were that were happening in the fir- early first century during Jesus's time, you can see them depicted in somewhat of a comical way, tradition in Fiddler on the Roof. But here's the point. Jesus shows up to a religious culture that is not what was intended for his people. And he basically begins to tell them with these first two Beatitudes especially, poor in spirit and mournful, <clears throat> that you are the ones who are lucky and fortunate in God's eyes, not the ones who are getting all of that religious do's and don'ts correctly, because all of that is lip service and all of that is works, and there isn't anything that any one of us can do to earn our place in the kingdom. That is the message that Jesus is beginning to present to everyone who's listening. It is totally countercultural. And so he says, if you are mourning, you will be comforted. Now, practically speaking, there's a lot, there was a lot for this nation to be mournful over. Their, their, their situation economically, socially, religiously, relationally, I mean, they literally had pretty much nothing as a people. There was a lot to be mournful about. And so practically speaking, he's giving them something that they want to hear, which is if you're mourning, you'll receive comfort. But in the context of the previous beatitude, it's interesting that he would jump from being spiritually bankrupt to being mournful. And the only obvious conclusion is that they are disgusted and mournful over their spiritual condition before God. Especially if they think that this man, this Jesus, is the Messiah. He is their Savior. He is their Redeemer. He is their potential King. And if he's telling them that the sin in their life has caused a divide between them and Yahweh, between them and God, that would cause them to be sorrowful and mournful. And then he says that they will be comforted. And I just love that. You know, I've mentioned it before that scripture, Paul tells us that we are to be anxious for nothing, that we are not to be worried about anything, that we are not to be uh, concerned, overly concerned or anxious or afraid or scared about our circumstances. But God, who is so full and rich in his mercy and grace towards us, he understands that on this side of eternity, because of the curse of sin, it's in human nature to be afraid 
and to be scared and to be worried and to feel alone and and to feel rejected when others are jerks to us. And the list goes on and on and on. But Paul says, make your requests be known to God. In other words, God wants to hear it. God wants you to climb up in his lap and say, whatever is real, genuine, and honest that's on your heart, God, I am scared. God, I am afraid. I am worried. I am pissed off. I am sad. Whatever it is. And then it doesn't even stop there. It says, and then the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, as a parallel to what Jesus is saying in Matthew 5, if your life's a mess and you reach out for the mercy of God, you are lucky because the kingdom is offered to you. And if you take that offering, that free offering of the kingdom, I'm going to expose the very thing that caused you to be out of fellowship with me. And I'm going to expose it to you. And you're lucky if you're one of those people. Because now you get to see what it was that you were doing or not doing that was causing a problem in, between you and me, that was causing you to be outside of where and how I intended you to live in the first place. The purpose that I had for your life was not possible because of this, because of these things. And then we acknowledge that thing that he has exposed to us. And we hate it. We hate it so much that we mourn over it. You know, when... When there is a broken relationship between two people that meant so much to each other, there is grief. There is, there, there is a period of grieving that takes place and there's mourning over that. That is, the, that is the imagery that I really want you to understand here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a Christian and I've been a Christian a long time. And I am not perfect by any stretch of, the imagine, stretch of the imagination. I love Jesus the best I can with all I got. And I want to serve him with my life every single day. But I am a fallen man just like everybody else. And whether you're a brand new Christian or someone who's been saved for over 30 years like I have, the experience should still be and is still the same. When there is a, when when I have sinned and disappointed God, he exposes it to me. And I hate it. I hate it so much that sometimes I cry. I feel mournful in my spirit and in my heart over my offenses to God. Because as a Christian, I want to please him with my life. And to know that I've done something that displeases him, sometimes is too much. Sometimes I am too much of a mule-headed man. And I think that every single one of us can relate to that. To, to one extent or the other. So what does it mean to be Hashtag blessed. What does it really mean to be blessed? If that's you tonight, if you if you are, have been shown what it is that's between you and God, and it disgusts you to the point where you don't even feel like you deserve to be in the presence of God where you don't even feel worthy of his blessing, you are lucky and you are fortunate and you are exactly where you are supposed to be. You have reached the bottom of your barrel. You are at the end of your rope. You are hanging on by a thread. You are white knuckling it because you've lost all hope and all sense of security and everything that you've tried, that you've done up till now. And the Lord has offered you the kingdom. And now you see the actual sin in your life and it disgusts you because 
you have offended God. You know what's interesting is that Scripture says that before salvation, we were at war with God. So a person who is not saved, a person who has not given their life to Jesus Christ, a person who has not put all of their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation and for their eternal destiny, that individual is at war with God. So it is that spiritual condition that the Lord finds us in when we are at the end of our rope. We are spiritually bankrupt. And then he exposes the weaponry of our war with God. That is that sin. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I hate the sin in my life. I hate that I can't always get it right. And you know, there are a lot of churches, there are a lot of preachers, there are a lot of Christians all over the place that end the story there in this state of despair, this state of defeat that you can even go to church on Sunday or watch a church service online on Sunday, and you've been looking forward to Sunday because you get to fellowship and worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you hear a message of defeat, that you're a piece of crap in God's economy, and that the story ends there. There are several more Beatitudes. We've only just begun. The story does not end here, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 51, that my sin is always before me. I am a human being. I will never get it 100% right. And my sin is always before me. It's I, I know it. And the sin that I don't know, he exposes it so that I do know it. And, this, and David says in that same psalm, Have mercy on me, O God, because I have sinned against you. That is that person. That is that person in the second beatitude. Have mercy on me. And then the Lord swoops in with such incredible comfort. But how, what is that comfort? The story doesn't end there. The comfort that we receive is knowing that the very person that we have offended is literally going to die on the cross and pay the penalty for those same offenses so that you and I don't have to. This is in Matthew chapter 5. We've only just begun to talk about Jesus's ministry here. These people have no idea that in just a little time, that same man who is giving them all of these beautiful promises, is going to be killed on a Roman cross for their very sins. He, they don't know this yet. But we, on this side of the cross, we know the story. And the story doesn't end at the cross. It begins at the cross. If you're listening to me tonight, and you're, and you're mourning over the sin in your life, and I'm going to take it one step further because I feel like somebody needs to hear this. Maybe it isn't necessarily the sin in your life that you're mourning over. But it's the way that you're feeling because of what other people have done to you. Especially in the church. And I want you to know that I get that. And in the not too distant future, in the not not too distant future, I'm actually going to talk about that very thing. We call it spiritual abuse. But tonight I want you to hear me. Whether you're a person that's mourning over the sin in your life, or you're a person whose spirit is broken because of what others have done to you, I want you to know that the story doesn't end there. I want you to know that there is healing, and there is grace, and there is comfort. In the arms of Jesus Christ. And that is what he offers. 
it's really unfortunate. I have my closest friend. He and I talk about about things like this quite often. And uh, he has a beautiful way of explaining it. That when it comes to the hurt and the abuse and the and and the agony that we have experienced at the expense of other Christians, it's unfortunate that the thing that hurt us the most is also the thing that the only thing that will help us and heal us, and that's the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't even count for you the number of people that I have had conversations with in my adult life that have said to me, I grew up in church, I went to Sunday school as a kid, I was raised Catholic, those kind of conversations. I know what they're saying. And in those conversations, they've they've unveiled a little bit more detail. But I know what they're saying. They're saying that because of what the church or somebody at the church did to me, I don't want anything to do with it. And I want you to know that I get that. And at some point in the not-too-distant future, we're going to talk about that, and you'll understand how I get that. But those people are not Christ. And the gospel still is the gospel. And Jesus' promises are still Jesus' promises, and they are just as relevant and true today as they were some 2,000 years ago. That if you were at the bottom of your barrel spiritually, and if you are reaching out and begging the Lord for rescue and mercy, and if you are hating the sin in your life at the realization that you have caused enmity enmity between yourself and Almighty God, that you will be considered lucky and fortunate and happy and blessed because the kingdom is offered to you and the Lord's comfort will wrap itself around you like supernatural arms that no one with human wisdom can explain or understand. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Ladies and gentlemen, if that is you tonight, reach out to me. Comment, send me a private message, I don't care. I know it's, I say it all the time, I know this is my microphone, I know this is my live stream, but this is your community too. You got questions, you got things you want to talk about, you want to reach out, feel free to do it. But God is good all the time. And the Lord's mercy is always there. We can beg him for it and he will give it to us. Stop. Let We need to stop trusting in our own efforts. We need to stop putting our faith and trust in leaders and in movements and in politicians and even, even in pastors. We need to, you know, I, I quote it all the time. Psalm 146.3, do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men in whom there is no salvation. There is no rescue in any human being no matter who they are or what they are about. The only rescue, the only mercy, the only comfort comes from Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And that is all I have to say about that. Ultimately, I hope that you hear the love and the message and what is presented here, and that is that that Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you could spend eternity with him. That is real talk, ladies and gentlemen. So I thank you for joining me here again tonight on another episode. We're here every single Sunday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And now we are not just on YouTube. We are on Facebook at Real Talk with Heath Brady, and we are on Twitch now as well. Thanks again for hanging out. Until next week, peace.